This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Okay. We were just discussing who would be dealing with this, what committees were talking about. Um, we had testimony at a, I'm on a committee called Children, Families, and Seniors. And obviously, this falls into that policy committee. Uh, Dave Agema is the uh, chairman of the appropriations for DHS, which governs all of these areas. And uh, we had the DHS director come, and Dave shared that he had a friend that had taken his child out of a restaurant to give him a spanking because he was throwing food in the restaurant. And he was called by Child Protective Services. Uh, Child Protective Services, you know, accused them of, of abuse, uh, he had his child taken away, luckily for just a couple of days, and was able to get his child back. And Dave asked the question of that director, uh, is corporal punishment, is spanking my child a, uh, a, a sign of abuse? And the director said, probably. And he said, well, what determines that? And he said, if you leave a mark, or if you leave a bruise, or anything on the child. Well, I can say this, my mom raised four boys, my mom and dad, and I, I caught some pretty good spankings in my day and deserved every one of them. And uh, my mom broke the blood vessels in her hand on the back of my jeans and my brother's jeans. And I was not abused. I love my mom to this day. She was raised in an orphanage. And uh, I think one of the problems that we have in this state, in this country, is we've lost the family as a central unit of our society. And we've taken that family away. Uh, we've expanded programs in our government to the point where probably very little is known about what they're doing. And it needs to be known. Uh, you mentioned the uh, decreasing budget. Maybe you have a, a situation where you start at zero and then prove why your, your program is needed and what's happening. Uh, I think that uh, an opportunity for committee hearings on some of you people sharing your stories and how those stories have shown that that particular agency is, is out of control, I think would definitely be a good start, <coughs> and definitely not the final answer. Uh, and obviously, we've got to hear from all sides of the story. I don't listen to just your testimony, it's only fair to listen to all testimony and make sure that all the facts are out in front before that happens. But just in, in my own personal knowledge of a good friend who's a pastor, uh, who had a daughter that went to school and told one of her teachers that her brother was going to kill her when she got home because she had done something to his room. And the friend told the teacher, the teacher told CPS, CPS took her away. And my friend fortunately had enough self-discipline and control not to scream at the woman that came to his house and said, we're not giving your child back until we can know she's safe. And he was furious, as any parent would be. You've taken my child, you've, you've uh, taken testimony from my child and never even informed me as a parent. Your parent is the person that is first in that child's life and should be first. So for me, I think uh, uh, our government's supposed to be there to assist families, not to get in their way or to disrupt them. So I would love to see uh, some movement forward in that area and definitely would uh, be willing to have some of you folks uh, that I've heard tonight 
be able to give testimony. Uh, when you do that, make sure that you are very careful. I know sometimes you want to name individuals because they've been against you. Uh, but all that's going to do is get you in trouble legally, and you don't want to do that. So be very careful in those areas. But um, definitely keep the proof that you have. Make sure that you uh, have that because these things need to be vetted and properly brought before uh, the committees that have control over those agencies. Our government is out of control in many areas. Um, I, I don't disagree um, with the fact that I think money drives a lot of this stuff. I, I, I can see that happening. I, I do um, want to point out that our candidate mentioned earlier, this didn't happen overnight. And as a society, we brought this on ourselves. Because and I shared the story on the floor and with my colleagues, but I'm going to share it with you, just so you have an idea how far we've come as a society. When I was two years old, my mother was a widow. I had one older brother, and she was pregnant. I had to have glasses. Couldn't afford it. If she didn't have a trade, she couldn't work. She was 19 years old. She went to get welfare. She was declined. She was declined welfare. You know why? Because she was a member of a church. So my mother went to the church. They bought me a pair of glasses. Two weeks later, I lost them. Now that would trigger child abuse <laughs> today. I'm serious. That's where we've come. My neighborhood, because my mother didn't dare go back to the church, my neighborhood got together and bought me another pair of glasses. My point to that story is, we used to be a society that looked out and cared for each other. You came from Africa. It's a shame that your neighborhood isn't there to help you with your children. They were for my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother couldn't have done it. She was right where you are. She couldn't have done it if it wasn't for my neighbors. I owe them a lot. We weren't rich. We we're very poor. But what we've given to the government is our life. And every time a politician promises you a free government gift, there's a cost. Mm -hmm. And it's called liberty. Every time you take a nickel from the government, whether it be federal or state, you've sold your soul to that government. And this is where we've gotten to. And it isn't because they're taking our money now. Now they're taking our kids. And the only way to stop that, we can start on legislation to, to tighten the laws up. But we got to stop leaning on government and start helping each other and build a culture that can self-sustain itself without the government. Amen. Well, boy, I wish I'd gone before Ken because he, he said it well. And he, he said a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I wore glasses. <laughs> I, uh, I truly believe what was said here, and I think the four of us are pretty much of the same mindset. Of, uh, the role of government has expanded so so fast and uh, been so intrusive. Um, I, I always wonder, I think it's a chicken and egg argument, did, uh, did government fill a hole that the churches quit, quit uh, serving us, or did the churches quit because government started in the social service business? I don't know which one's right. But I think 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was the role of our neighbors and of our churches uh, to take care of its fellow man. And uh, it's a shame today that uh, you know churches have to be urged and coached and, and, and do a good job, but not the job that we probably did as neighbors 50 years ago. Uh, one statistic that I, I heard in, in my own church a, a few weeks ago, we have somewhere around 44 hundred kids in Michigan in the social in the uh, in the foster care system we have 10,000 churches that's a solvable problem that's less than one child for every two churches we can do this without the government if we'd all just say it's our responsibility it's my responsibility it's Joe's responsibility 
Um, and we don't do that enough. So I, I Tom is uh, probably in the best position um, of the four of us here to, on, on the right committee. I would encourage you to, uh, to bring this uh, to Lansing. I would be happy to help. Ken made a suggestion. Perhaps the Judiciary Committee is another um, avenue. Uh, what amazes me from your testimony is the fact uh, the one common theme that I heard is uh, kind of the rule of law is gone. That there's a, the, the lack of evidence uh, to basically convict you um, is pretty scary. And uh, it, I think that's that has to be said. I, I agree with Tom, though. I think this is a little scary for him because we're hearing one side. And I think we need to have both sides at the table uh, to hear hear the other side of it as well. But I would be uh, happy to assist if I can. Are you aware? Are you aware there was a committee a couple months ago? A meeting held. DHS, the director herself, was invited dealing with this particular issue. No one from DHS was there to be able to respond to the people who were supposed to challenge DHS on their complaints. Nobody from DHS could respond. State Representative Ajma gave it to somebody from DHS who was only there for finance, solely for finance, and gave it to this female individual and said, I want to get a response. To this day, after calling Mr. Ajma's office, they still have not received a response. I myself have called. Ajma's office and the committee hands are particularly tied at this time because all they can do is what? Appropriate funds. But yet, as you see, we're only a few compared to millions or thousands within the state that's going through the process of alienation from our children and division of a family. So what do you do when you do have your local government we, the people, voted them in, but guess what? We're stuck for whatever amount of term to vote the right person in and pray to God and hope that person does their job. But what we're finding is, once they're in office, people who do have the powers are not implementing or exercising their powers to stop and implement a change. So my question to this panel, where do we start? Because we already started destroying lives by voting people in, we put them in the position. We hope for a change. With well, each election, we hope for a change. When does it really start? Can we get an answer? Uh, it starts this year. Yeah, the question, the question was made, uh, um, how do you start to take finances away from the government? Let me tell you, it's a costly thing. We've done that already in this legislature. We've cut budgets on government big time. Just, be, just because we didn't have the money to support them anymore. And many of us have been getting death threats, hate mails. Recalls. Recalls. It's not pretty. It's not pretty, but we're doing it because it's what Michigan deserves. And we're not done. We're going to move forward. Government has to be reined in. I met with a business owner today. Same type of scenario that I heard from you, only it's what they're doing to his business and they're choking the life out of him. That's why our jobs are gone, folks. It's the same scenario with every every public, private or private entity that's out there. And when we call and we can't get answers for a month or two, that's something because we're supposed to be the government. And we can't even get answers from our own departments that are under, you know, the, the governor's direction. Again, so it's again, time what, to shake them so, up. I know he's put some new directors right. in, and I think we've already seen some good movement in some of those areas. It's a beautiful thing, having new directors, but what's sad is, is when you have a new director in, and that director is not aware of the same people are in place that was corrupt in the system before. You spoke earlier as far as contacting the Judicial Committee. How many people here have contacted the Judicial Committee? Okay, and no results. Please, go ahead. Uh, listen, my, my, my name is Richard Owens. I live in Lowell, so I've been home in a couple of your areas. Uh, uh, I've been with the family court system now, and I thank God every morning, every evening that I don't have to go to the CPS system. 
do a lot of volunteer work at Prince Water for Shreveport here in Cape County. Do our Shreveport, I had any contact with a lot of people that deal with the CPS system. So many over here in the corner brought up an uh, interesting subject. Uh, you know, uh, when you have, we already have, in my opinion, the laws in place, but in civil court, in civil court, or family court, you guys, not you guys, but the previous seat holders, even certain court judges, a wide range of latitude in interpreting the law. Okay. You heard today that you got some judges, and I can add to the list, you know, that that make the law as they go, they ignore the written law, they make their own law. You know. And <clears throat> if you guys are gonna spend all this time and spend my tax paying money writing these walls up, I'll be honest with you, I wanna see them enforced. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want some certain court judge who doesn't know anything about these people's children to give up those those kids' rights. That's right. I don't want some certain court judge in family court, you know, to give up my rights because of the wide range of latitude that you guys have allowed the certain court judges to have. Mm -hmm. It needs to be, in my opinion, start with taking away that wide range of latitude and start making these judges follow the written law, not their opinion or their feeling or how you're dressed today or, or I don't like how you look or I had a rough night last night. So, All right, well, thank good. you very much for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Van Worken, we have something quick a minute? Sure. And, uh, uh, I just we're wanted almost to, out of time on our tape. Absolutely. I uh, just want to introduce myself as well. Greg Van Worken, I'm the district director for Congressman Bill Heisinga. Uh, previously, I served in Washington, D.C. with Congressman Pete Hoekstra, who was a, a champion of, of parental rights. Um, I can tell you, me, um, him, uh, Pete, and uh, another guy in our office would devise different ways to educate the public uh, on this issue. We would come up, we create a website on the issue. Uh, we did a lot of press conferences on the issues. We tried doing creative ways to bring light to this issue. And we got a, a lot of co-sponsors on, on, on this resolution, resolution that you you handed out here. I don't know if that's been introduced yet this Congress, but I can tell you that my current boss, Bill Heisinga, is also of the same passion for this issue and for this amendment um, to ensure that, that parents do maintain their, their rights and that uh, the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child doesn't pass uh, that uh, the Senate may consider. So wanted to, uh, inject that into the conversation. We're fully aware of, of the, the issues that you're facing and we're passionate about it and, and trying to find that, that resolution. So thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, my part uh, will be fairly short here. Uh, just some suggestions that have come from our group and we've kind of put these down on paper in a small committee with say Judith and Dean and myself and approved them uh, by our board and so forth. Um, at the international level, we cannot have the uh, UN uh, United Nations Treaty on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it's, as, as Greg has just mentioned. Uh, at the national level, we've got to have the United States Parental Rights Amendment that Peter Hoekstra um, sponsored first, and that I believe will be introduced real soon, and, and, and we've got to get people behind that. And so at the state level, what we need is for you folks to memorialize the Congress to get that parental rights amendment passed. Dave Agema had a resolution, it got stopped in committee, uh, even though it had a majority of co-sponsors. Uh, Bill Hardman had sponsors uh, and you know, we have t been talking with him. Um, at the state level, there's something that we have to suggest that is a voucher system to replace, uh, modify the uh, court appointed attorney system. Right now, court-appointed attorneys are getting a contract in the, with the judges, okay? And I can show you in my county which court-appointed attorneys gave how much to which judge's campaign. And I think there might be an ethical problem there, okay? 
Uh, our suggestion, and this came out of this group and came, uh, Fulton Sheen wrote it first, and I think probably most of you know Fulton, good guy. Um, some kind of a voucher that says, Here, here's your voucher, go find an attorney, pick anyone you want. We pay this much. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I have a friend who <coughs> I am afraid he will soon be sentenced to life in prison because his court appointed attorney um, fumbled the ball. And uh, another attorney who's a friend, uh, his, his uh, comment to me was, these court appointed attorneys, they just lay down for this. So uh, that's something that can be fixed, okay? Hearsay is something that can be uh, improved. Hearsay in court, <coughs> licensing of child protective services workers. We're hearing uh, low levels of education. You heard some very unpleasant comments that have been made by CPS workers. One of our goals is to raise the standard of proof for temporary removal from preponderance up to clearing convincing. We want to see the standard for, and I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, the list, so don't worry if you're not getting this, but we want to see the standard for uh, termination of parental rights raised from clear and convincing up to beyond reasonable doubt. Think of this as this is the worst thing that could happen to a good parent is have their children taken away yeah, and gone somewhere and not know where they are. <laughs> and they spend tens of thousands trying to fight it. I just got a seatbelt ticket. You know, we had a polite conversation, shook hands with a police officer, thanked him. Uh, I said, if I told you a pretty girl distracted me, would, would you tear it up? He said, I didn't see one. Well, she's still a couple miles away, you know. Anyway, uh, that's a clear-cut thing, but it's just the opposite with this uh, child protective services stuff. How much food are you supposed to have in the refrigerator? Okay, well, how, how much are you supposed to, to pay in costs uh, if you don't have enough food in the refrigerator? And those things are comments that we have heard. Staying on the living room carpet. And uh, one person here spent 60000 That's an awful lot of money. Dennis had his water tested in the kitchen to see if it was hot enough. So uh, these are some of the things that can be done at the state level. We need to do a better job of defining what abuse really is. We have a terrible term called best interest of the child. If we asked 1000 uh, child protective service workers and judges what that meant we'd get a thousand different answers we, we have to asked do a, a better the director and he couldn't come up with a good answer. so there's those are some of the things we need to do those are things we can do so uh, we are about out of time on our tape I want to thank everyone for coming, for uh, behaving in such a cordial uh, manner. Uh, even when you've got such uh, hurts in your heart, I, mm. I know what it's like. Uh, yeah, and, and I want to thank you gentlemen for, for coming. Uh, we hope that we have begun a conversation, not ended a conversation. Uh, we hope that we can uh, get some things accomplished. Uh, we hope that we can improve the system. Well, at, at the federal level, one of the biggest things is that flow of federal money into the states. I know when I worked uh, topping onions, I knew it was 10 cents a crate, and I worked, you know, well, fairly hard to do it. When I, when I uh, worked uh, on a piecework basis uh, as an auto mechanic, I knew just how long, uh, what, what was going to get paid for. And I, I remember a, a tune-up I did in 15 minutes, and I did it right. Okay, when money is there, money talks, and that is what happens when there's a flow of money that rewards states for taking children from their parents. It kind of puts an ethical conflict in the system, kind of puts a little perversion in the system. That's one of the things we need to do. What the states can do is memorialize the Congress to uh, make available more flat grants, such as Florida and California used. Rather than getting uh, money on a piecework basis, they got a flat grant, and that was uh, done under the Bush administration, and th those uh, have run out. That's one thing that can be done at the federal level. So there are things that can be done, and uh, again, I hope that we have begun a conversation, not ended a conversation. I hope that we can uh, work together to improve this. Um, again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and uh, it's been good. I appreciate it very much.